Tegan, do you want to start us off a little bit? <laughs> sure. Hi, I'm Tegan Lind. As some of you guys may know, um, I'm in ninth grade and I play soccer and basketball for the high school. So we just want to say thank you everyone for joining us today. This presentation is intended to focus on current events and the impact of COVID-19 political unrest in our well-being. We want to create a space for all students to come in and ask questions. So there'll be opportunities to ask questions via the chat function. And also if you raise your hand, we can unmute you and you can ask a question. Nicely done, Tegan. So Dr. Lonnie Lawrence is who we're welcoming today. She's the Director of Wellness and Clinical Services for the New York Football uh, Giants, for the New York Giants football team. She served as a clinical and sports psychologist at the University of Southern California and has worked with professional and Olympic athletes. Additionally, she's given domestic and international presentations on the unique challenges faced by LGBTQ student athletes, before her career in professional sports, she was a girls basketball player and a high jumper at Falmouth High School. Additionally, according to Mrs. Burke, our current uh, athletic director, she's not surprised how far Dr. Lawrence has come. She said that uh, Dr. Lawrence is as special now as she was when she attended Falmouth High School. That is very nice of her to say that. Yeah. And then one other thing, um, I just wanted students and teachers to be aware, we also have uh, Ms. Heather Nebulous, who is not only a licensed school adjustment counselor and clinical social worker, she's also trained and as a certified mindfulness meditation instructor. Um, so for any student or teacher that finds anything triggering or has a rough time, Ms. Nebulous is here to take you to a breakout room if you need to uh, need some support. Perfect. Thank you. <laughs> All right, let's just jump into this. Go ahead, Tegan. Okay, so can you tell us a little bit about your experience growing up in Falmouth? So first, let me say thank you. I can't I can't see people's faces um, while, I'm, while I'm talking to everyone, but I do see some people on the attendees list. I am so happy just to be back and being able to speak to you all in Falmouth. I have really fond <laughs> memories of growing up um, and going to high school here. So just thank you for giving me the uh, opportunity to come back and say hi. Um, for those who, uh, who um, don't know me, which is probably the vast majority, I, uh, my family's originally from New York and I moved to the Cape when I was three years old. I, uh, my dad was in the Coast Guard and I don't know how many people know about Otis Air Force Base, but it's right next to Falmouth. And so I grew up on the Air Force Base until I was about 10 years old. And my parents decided that they wanted to um, leave the base and, um, and move uh, the family to another town. At the time, Bourne High School, I, I don't wanna speak bad about anyone, Bourne High School's um, uh, accreditation wasn't that great. And so they thought that there's this really great town called Falmouth that we can move to. And for me, it was a complete 360. I don't think they probably do this at Moore's Pond anymore, but my first uh, physical education class was archery. So <laughs> I was 10 years old and they gave me a bow and an arrow <laughs> to shoot at a target. And I remember thinking like, wow, I'm not in Kansas anymore. Like where did my parents move me to? And uh, another um, class I had was gymnastics field hockey, and I realized that um, moving to Falmouth was going to be pretty special and that it would provide me um, opportunities that I don't think I would have had if we had stayed um, in Otis. And at the same time, um, there were challenges growing up in Falmouth. Uh, my mom was the first affirmative action officer for the town of Falmouth. And um, one of the things my parents really enjoyed about the town was that before the term anti-racist became a thing, I think Falmouth was really focused on being proactive and at least the town, right? Uh, and learning more about social injustice, being accepting and inclusive. And so, one of the reasons why I think my parents really loved Falmouth was that they knew that they would feel open and, and welcomed here. 
um, one of the challenges I had was as a young African-American girl growing up, um, I was probably one of the few students of color, uh, whether it's in Morris Pond or, or the Lawrence School. And there were certainly other diverse students. Um, some were Cape Verdean, some were Wampanoag. Um, but in terms of um, being African-American, uh, there, there, weren't, there weren't too many families. And so, especially during Morris Pond, um, certainly at the Lawrence School, uh, being teased for my race, being made fun of, um, being called names uh, was a, a challenge that I had, um, maybe not on a daily basis, but quite often. Uh, going on a school bus and hearing racist jokes um, and, and having to, and feeling like I couldn't talk to people about it um, was, was especially hard. And for, for those who, who may not know, um, I was realizing too, like in, in junior high that, uh, that I was thinking like, I think I, I, think I might be gay or, or at least bi. And so going into high school and not knowing who would be a safe person to talk to was particularly hard. And I think sometimes there's a lot of stereotypes about women's basketball players identifying um, as gay, but it's actually, uh, it's actually not, um, that's not a true stereotype. You're gonna find gay and lesbian athletes regardless of the sport. I don't, I don't care if it's soccer or track, right? Um, and women's basketball, women's basketball in particular can be um, a bit homophobic because you have um, that stereotype that people don't wanna identify with. And so for me going to um, sleepovers, I don't know if, if teams still do this, but for, for when I went to school, you would have like a team sleepover or a team dinner. And the topic of, uh, if you're watching a movie, I, I remember one time two girls kissed and a question came up of like whether or not that was appropriate. And as I sat to listen to the answer, the team captain immediately said, absolutely not, that it's wrong to be gay and that um, in her family, um, they, they would not, they would never allow her to identify as gay or lesbian. And so despite Falmouth being um, an anti-racist community who um, that is proactive in trying to balance social justice, racial injustice, um, being more welcoming to the LGBTQ rainbow, I still felt challenges within my identity and knowing who to trust and who my peers were. And I think one of the reasons why I wanted to talk to you all today was to, to let you know that even being a, a safe peer, being involved in different groups, being able to express your support toward other minority groups or other people or your friends. Those are some of the things that helped me get through those experiences, whether it was in junior high or even in high school, that I had peers that I knew that maybe I wasn't ready to come out to them or to share how I felt or how I identified, but I knew that they were safe, right? And of course, this kind of led to my career going into psychology and especially working with athletes who have the same struggles and concerns that I did growing up. Um, and so <laughs> I didn't mean to start this talk off kind of heavy, but I do, I do think it's kind of important to share um, a little bit about myself and my perspective and, and the experiences I had. And I know that especially coming out isn't the same when I was in high school, you know, eons ago, a lot of people don't go through that process, but, um, uh, but I do think it's important to kind of share how each one of you can positively influence someone who maybe struggled the way I did growing up. Um, so with that, I'm going to give it back to, oh, you know what, I forgot to say this one thing. Um, 
for anyone who has questions, we're going to set aside some time at the end for people to um, ask questions and uh, to use the chat. But if you have any questions as I kind of as we kind of talk this hour, please know that you can use your raise the hand function. You can type a question into the chat, and I'll do my best to answer as we kind of go, so you don't have to wait until the end. And then I think a lot of people maybe know that we're recording. There's like a little button kind of up there showing. We're going to turn off that recording at one o'clock if you want to wait to ask your question until afterwards. So just wanted to be sure that everybody everybody knew that. Um, how about we, one, one thing I, I think I might want to do is, um, one, one thing I talked about, some of the stressors, some of the things that impacted me while I was a student at, 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 um, at Falmouth, I want to kind of get to know what everyone else's experience, like during this COVID social unrest period that we're going through right now, like we're done with 2020, but 2021 seems just as, um, stressful. So I'm going to um, have Tegan launch the next poll. And I just want to get a sense of what are some of the stressors you all are facing during, during this time period. So for those, just want to make sure that you can see it. It says, what has been the most stressful aspect of the fall and winter quarters this year? And I know for some, like, I think we might have some athletes on this call. You know, I, I think there's been some questions about whether or not your season's going to start, whether or not you're going to be able to play in a championship game. If I remember correctly, I think the, the boys basketball team just won a huge game. Was that yesterday, I think. Um, so just, you know, what are some of the stresses you guys are all facing? Maybe give it another like couple of seconds. All right, if we wanna see what the results are. Feeling isolated is huge. Watching the news, social media is pretty big. Academics is another big one. Um, unknown start to the season, some family stuff. Yeah, and some, some other things too. If people wanna type into the chat what the other things are, if you feel comfortable about that, that'd be great. Um, but I'm, I'm seeing certainly, you know, um, a, co a couple of themes. Um, Tegan, I know that you have a question for me. You can, you can go ahead and ask. Uh, um, what type of stressors have impacted professional athletes the most this year? So that's, that's a great question. Um, it's, it's the same thing all of you have just written. So I know I spent a lot of time talking about Falmouth um, and my experience growing up there. Um, after I left Falmouth, I got to play at Northeastern University, Division I school, played overseas, and decided that I really enjoyed working with um, athletes. And so I went back to school um, at Boston University and then at University of Denver uh, to learn more about, about sports psychology. And uh, through that experience, and especially this year working with the Giants, I recognized that um, the same problem professional athletes have are the same problems you guys just indicated um, while you're in high school. A lot of our guys, um, some of them aren't married. Some of them don't have family. Some of them are from the South and they're by themselves in New York City um, with nothing to do. New York City is completely shut down. They have an apartment and they're completely by themselves. And I don't know about um, some of the teams on here, but our players are not allowed to hang out with each other outside of the facility. So even though they're all going home, they can't be in the same um, room together, even just to play Xbox or something. And so, um, so one big thing has been isolation and our guys feeling as though um, they're constantly by themselves and not being able to connect with other people. Um, there's a lot of pressure. People put down um, social media and watching the news. You can imagine that if you're bored, you're probably going through your social media feed all the time. Now, some of it might be fun, like you're looking at TikTok or something, but for a lot of our players, they're looking at Twitter. And if anyone knows about anything about Twitter, it could be pretty negative. 
and people saying or writing negative things about you, right? And so for a lot of, a lot of our guys during the season, they put their um, social media accounts away. And that doesn't, maybe that doesn't fit for everyone, but for our players, it was really helpful not to really pay attention to all of the negativity, especially if it was directed to them on there. And then of course, there's different health issues because of COVID. Maybe they have a family member that's sick. We've had a couple of guys who've had COVID on our team and having to be able to um, be able to, to manage that. Um, some of our guys were dealing with anxiety. Uh, some of them have asthma and they didn't want to get COVID and coming here and practicing can be challenging too. And so the same things that you all listed on that last um, poll are the exact same things that professional athletes are really trying to manage as well. Um, I'm just looking at the, the chat. Um, somebody was saying to um, stressors with anxiety, ADHD makes it really difficult because you can't really go out or do anything. Um, the one thing that has been good, um, if there's anything good to say about COVID, is that they really helped um, some of our players really focus on watching film, on working out. And I could see that that could be the same thing for you guys, that maybe you're studying a little bit more or able to get more homework done or get other things done because now you, you don't have as many distractions, but all those things have been a challenge for, for the players as, as well. Um, maybe, maybe I'll do this. Um, I know that we have another poll question. So we kind of talked about some of the stressors that you guys have had. Now I'd like to hear about how do you manage some of those stressors? So when you're feeling overwhelmed, um, what are some of the things that you do to kind of help cope with your stress? Maybe we can throw that poll up. Yeah, that'd be great. Let me see if we have some of the results. I don't know if you can throw up the results, Mr. Weber. There we go. So working out is a big one. Listening to music, apparently Taylor Swift is what everyone is listening to. Um, talk with friends, that's pretty huge. Uh, read, play video games, not sure how. I mean, that's nice to see that not sure how is at less than like at 1%. And then 7% is other. If people have, I'm curious to hear if, um, if people can type into the chat uh, what they mean by other. Um, that would be, that would be great. Um, one of the things that I think is really important to, to learn about with stress. So, you know, we have, we have COVID, we have a lot of um, things coming up in terms of social justice. We have academic stressors. We have so many things going on, sometimes an unknown season. For one thing that I teach professional athletes is creating a game plan around your stress, right? So there's some stress that we absolutely cannot control. We can't control COVID, we can't control what's on the news, um, but, we, but we are able to manage the things that we can't control. And we can also figure out ways to reduce the things that we can control. So I'm talking a lot, <laughs> what does that mean? So basically is that you wanna do two things. First, you wanna know when you're stressed out. And if you guys were, sometimes I wish I could unmute you guys because I would love to hear, how do you know when you're stressed out? So maybe you can put it in, in the chat. Um, but one thing is, is really figuring out how do you know when you're stressed out? Do you, for me, I get irritable and I'm pretty nice. So if I'm getting mad or irritated, I know that's not a good thing. 
Um, for other people, you start thinking all the time and you can't turn it off. Sometimes your stomach is in knots. And so the first thing you want to do is really understand how do you know when you're, um, when you're stressed. Somebody just wrote the tone of your voice changes. People are talking about overthinking things. Yeah, those are all great examples. Sometimes you can't sleep. Sometimes you can't eat. For other people, you eat too much. You sleep too much. I have here um, lack of focus, all those things. So the first thing you want to do is really understand how do I know I'm stressed? Um, somebody just wrote down your heart's beating faster, you feel lightheaded, you're hesitant, maybe unconfident. And so if you start recognizing like, oh, wow, I'm being irritable right now, or, or like, wow, I'm really, my heart rate is really beating fast. That's like one of the first signs you can see that, that you're feeling stressed out. So first you wanna recognize your signs of stress. And then you wanna have a plan to address the stress that you can't control and address the stress that you can control. So if I'm feeling overwhelmed, if I'm overthinking, what are some things I can do to reduce my anxiety, to reduce my stress? And we've talked about it a little bit. We talked about listening to music. We talked about taking a deep breath, but we also talked about talking to our friends. And the, I think that is one of the most important things that you, you can do. And it could be talking to a friend, it could be talking to a counselor, it could be talking to your parents, but having a plan ahead of time before you get too stressed out can really help you manage some of the feeling, some of the overwhelm that you have. Even having a plan of if you're feeling isolated, how often do you use FaceTime with your, with your friends? How often do you use, I think um, people used to use like house party. I don't know if you guys are using house party or or stuff like that, but having a plan to figure out how to deal with those stressors can be can be helpful as well, right? And so um, uh, as we kind of talk a little bit more about everything that's been happening in 2020 and 2021, having a good idea of how you feel stress and having a plan ahead of time of how you want to manage it can be really can be really helpful. Um, Tegan, I think you might have another question for me. Yeah. So what are some ways professional athletes are coping with their stresses and issues that have come up from racial injustice, transgender rights, and COVID-19? Right. That's a good question. So I think everybody um, um, was impacted by the murder of George Floyd back in May. And there's been different ways that athletes have decided to deal with that, whether it's been um, nonviolent protests in the form of kneeling, or um, being able to join different groups or clubs to be able to have um, a support system and be able to communicate some of the concerns that they have. Uh, for the Giants, one of the things that the players did was called Team of Teams. And I'm sure everybody's on their laptop right now. So if you wanted to type in like Team of Teams, Giants, it will pop up. Um, but one of the things the Giants did was they decided to break the team up. It was about, you know, 52 guys on a, on a roster, and we broke the teams up into nine teams. And um, each team had to cover a certain area of New York. So we had a Queens team, um, a Brooklyn team, a Bronx team, a New York team and everything. And they each picked a nonprofit that they were gonna work with for the year. And some of the nonprofits were focused on, on um, voting, some of it was focused on hunger. Some of it was focused on domestic violence. But the guys realized, especially the guys who decided to kneel during the, during the anthem, they wanted to do more than just do a protest. They wanted to do something that would positively impact their, their neighborhood and would make change. And especially last year, um, and they wanted to do something nonpartisan, right? So voting, whether you're a Democrat or Republican, everyone should, should be able to vote, right? And so they were able to find ways that they would be able to support neighborhoods and be able to um, make the, the different regions around uh, New York football giants um, better by participating in these different activities. And then the other thing that they did was just have space to talk about different things that impacted them. So we 
had the whole team talk about racial injustice and how it impacted players, how it impacted coaches, how it impacted the organization. And so by providing space, um, players felt heard, um, coaches had a better understanding of what was impacting the players. And then there was this um, ability to figure out how to make the Giants better and how to make the region better, which I think was really well received. And I know that South High School is not the uh, New York football Giants, but I would encourage you all, you know, the students who are listening in, if there are things that you would like to see change, the only way it's really gonna change is with your involvement. And that there's different groups that uh, exist within Falmouth High that you could participate in and have your voice heard, right? I think oftentimes we want change to come from, you know, our principal or from our teachers, but I would encourage you all to recognize that um, even at the high school level, um, your participation in groups can really help um, make change and have your voices be heard in a different way than maybe um, just you know tweeting or using social media um, to um, to kind of share your thoughts. That 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 energy can be directed. Um, so that that's one of the things that the Giants did that I that I am really proud to be a part of. And I think it's going to be something that they're going to continue to do because it had such a positive impact on the surrounding communities within within the region. Uh, a question just came in. Um, Tegan, do you mind reading it out loud? Sure. Um, it says, were you ever scared or worried to make the change happen for yourself and to speak out? Yeah, so maybe uh, you may be talking about um, whether it's social injustice or um, my experience maybe being a, um, a gay woman of color. Uh, I've certainly, not so much now, I, I don't know if it's just coming with age or experience, but um, in general, okay, thank you. Um, I certainly especially have been scared um, to discuss really challenging topics for fear of people's negative reactions, certainly. Even talking about this today, you know, I think, um, I, I certainly am aware that people might be listening to me and having, um, maybe not, but like a, that there could be a negative response or that somebody may not agree with what I'm saying, right? Uh, but what I go back to is what I, what are my values and what I value is um, a society that feels safe for everyone. Um, I value uh, honesty. I, I value inclusion. I value diversity. There, there's certain things that I feel very confident in, um, in what I think is important. And I, I think as long as I'm speaking to my values and they're coming from a place of integrity they're coming from a place of care and concern of others. Um, I can I can always feel confident in what I'm talking about, even if other people disagree. And it's okay that other people may have different a different set of values for themselves. It's it's okay if they even disagree with me because there's going to be people who who do that. saying it with integrity and, and honesty, I'm okay with people disagreeing. Um, so, uh, so yeah, so certainly I think there's been times where I've been scared and concerned, but I always come back to what am I trying to communicate? And am I trying to bring people together when I talk about that? And I, and I think I am. And so I can feel confident in sharing that, um, my thoughts or opinions in, in, um, in doing that. I don't know if that answers the question, but that's, that's how I would respond to it. Um, was it hard? Oh, go ahead, Tegan. Can you, can you read it out loud? Um, someone asked, was it a hard realization that people won't always agree with you? Um, so I think I'll go back to my experience growing up in Falmouth. Uh, I think I learned at an early age that simply because of the color of my skin, 
there are gonna be people who may not like me, who will tease me, um, who will belittle me or make jokes about me, right? And so um, I think that was a hard realization growing up and, and experiencing that and feeling that. And I had to learn um, how to communicate. Well, for, first I had to learn how to be proud of who I am and my, all of my different intersecting identities and feeling confident um, in, in, those, in those spaces. And also, I know this is gonna sound strange, having empathy for others who are maybe not ignorant, but just lack understanding that maybe came from a family that was maybe not as welcoming or as open as mine. And that um, I truly believe that through education, through experience, through communication, that you can help people learn more. Um, so, so even if I don't, even if somebody disagrees with me, I always hold up hope that if I have a conversation with them, that I might get them to think a little bit, that I might get them to plant a small seed, and that somebody else may come along and water that seed a little bit. If I can just plant a seed into somebody's mind to think just a little bit differently, right? I don't have to change someone in one conversation, but if I can just move them just a little bit to thinking a little bit differently, I'm, I'm okay with that. So I try not to think about the disagreement. I try to think more about um, communicating my experience and hopefully that having an impact. That's a great question, great question. Um, Tegan, I think you might have another question for me, not. Um, this last one is just for a student. So how can students best approach admin, teachers, coaches, and just parents in general about mental health struggles and is there such thing as a mental health day? Oh, thank you for reminding me of that question. Um, so this is something that's come up a lot uh, within university athletics that a lot of division one players are really overwhelmed. And I don't know how many, how many seniors we have, um, you know, attending this talk today, but, um, and how many of those seniors want to play college basketball, hockey, or what have you. But, um, but it's, it's a lot of work, which you already know, in terms of the hours of academics, watching film, going to practice, lifting. You have um, captain's practices and stuff. And so a lot of times players are asking about, can I take a mental health day? Um, and one of the things I always encourage student athletes before talking to their coach about this is really making sure that um, uh, that ability to communicate, that there's gonna be times that you feel overwhelmed. There's gonna be times, just like when you're feeling physically sick, you can't make it to practice, that something may come up unexpectedly, whether it's, um, um, like a family member being sick or, or a breakup or an exam. And one of the things I really encourage students to do is to communicate, whether it's to your teacher, to your coach, those times that you're feeling overwhelmed, right? Being able to communicate to them, if you, if you do need to take a day off, that, um, that, it's not, that it's not you just disappearing and not showing up, but that you have the ability to recognize again when you're feeling overwhelmed and being able to think ahead of time of a plan that you have in place to be able to talk to your coach, to be able to talk to your teacher when you're overwhelmed. And my hope is that that teacher or coach is empathetic and understanding. Um, I think the concern that teachers and coaches sometimes have is that they don't want students to take advantage of taking time off, of doing something last second, of maybe using it as an excuse because you didn't give yourself enough time to write that 10 page paper or something, right? So I, so I always encourage students, if you're getting to the point where you need to take that mental health day, that you're, that you're thoughtful and you really communicate um, what's happening for your, for your parent or for your, um, your, the adult in your life, uh, your teacher or coach to really understand what's, what's going on. Um, Tegan, I think there's another question on there. There's two questions. The first one is, what is 
what are the best strategies that have worked for you when dealing with mental health? Um, so uh, I don't know if you mean personally or if you mean professionally, but I'll, I'll answer it as a, as a professional. I, I can also answer it personally if you want, but um, when, I, when I meet with student athletes, um, and I'm glad that we have the adjustment counselor here because I think she'll agree, I'm a huge proponent of mindfulness. And, you know, I think maybe a lot of the students may not really know or understand what that is. Um, but I do think that um, being able to practice mindfulness and, and this is like meditation, like deep breathing, it's doing body scans, any, any team from my Olympic athletes to the athletes I worked with at USC to my current New York football giant fam, I have emphasized using meditation and practicing mindfulness in a way to manage mental health. And the reason why meditation is so helpful is that it teaches you to learn yourself, to learn how you're feeling mentally, physically, and emotionally. It allows you to, for people who overthink, who go to bed and, and you can't go to sleep because you're thinking so much, being able to take a simple deep breath in and really focusing on that exhale helps kind of ease your mind a little bit. It makes you feel present. For the athletes who are on this call right now, um, before a game, you probably, I don't know if you guys still do this, but when I played on the girls basketball team, we would shut off the lights before we play and we would all take, hold hands and take deep breaths. And I didn't realize it at the time, but we were practicing meditation before we would play, play in a game, you know? And so um, I, for me and what I do with my athletes, meditation is, is on top of the list. Um, what was the other question, Tegan? Um, another question was, from a coaching perspective, what is some advice to create a balance of mental health and athletics? It's a good question. Um, and so I'm, I'm, from a coaching perspective, balance of, so I, I do think that um, there are certain things within our control and a lot more other things that are not <laughs> within our control. And having a plan to deal with the thing. Well, okay, let me take a step back. Um, for athletes, athletes and coaches are really good at three things, right? Athletes are really good. If I'm like, if I'm not hitting a foul shot, I'll go to practice, right? And I'll, I'll practice like extra to get my foul shot, right? So I'm really good at working really hard. Um, if my foul shot's not working, I'll really try to focus. So I'm very good at focusing. And let's say I still miss it and Coach Busher is yelling at me or something. He doesn't really yell, but let's say he is. Um, you know, I'm really good at ignoring him and refocusing on, on my next shot, right? And so um, players are really good at trying really hard, doing extra work, and ignoring their feelings. But that's not helpful if a family member's sick. That's not helpful if somebody breaks up with me. Me trying really hard after somebody breaks up with me is probably not the best way to respond to that person, right? And so what we need to do is just recognize that those three things are good. It's probably what makes you a good coach or makes you a good athlete, um, but we need more than that. We need other things to kind of deal with the stressors in our life. And so whether that's meditation, whether that's talking to other people, whether that's recognizing a work-life balance and realizing that work-life balance doesn't mean each day or week. It means I'm gonna be busy during the basketball season and my balance is gonna be in the spring once that season is over, right? It's, it's kind of recognizing the ebbs and flows of when you can take care of yourself versus when you have to kind of get through the stressful periods. So, um, so I try to teach that with my athletes that you need more than just a hammer you need a couple of things that you can rely on to help you through these stressful moments. And that work-life balance doesn't mean each day, it kind of means throughout the year being, being thoughtful about that. Um, did I answer all the questions, Tegan, I think? Okay, all right, good. Those are the only ones we had in the chat. But um, if any of the students have any questions for Dr. Lani, you can please use the chat or use the raise your hand feature and then we can unmute you and you can ask. Yeah, I, I hate to say it. I don't love to talk so much. So I would love to hear, um, hear some questions that people may, may say. And I don't know if people can unmute. You can also ask if I am muting, but I, I don't know if that's possible. 
once they raise their hands, I'll be able to let them in to be able to. If we're in a pause point right now, would it be um, maybe stop the recording now so we can kind of go forward from here? I know we said one o'clock, but would you rather do yeah. something? Yeah, no, that sounds that sounds like a good.